Hi, my name is Sean Salmon, and I'm the Vice President of MCLE at Quimby. Uh, today, I have the distinct pleasure of interviewing Lars Daniel um, so that he can talk about forensic evidence at trial. Hi, I'm Lars Daniel, the Practice Leader of Digital Forensics here at Invista Forensics. And today, I'd like to start this class with the following case example. In this case, we were retained by the attorney representing the motor carrier company. On the opposite side, there was a plaintiff's expert. The plaintiff's expert on the opposite side was making two claims. First, that the driver was distracted at the time of the accident and that the driver was fatigued because they had not received enough sleep. Now, this expert utilized the call detail records and the driver's logs to make the argument on the lifestyle analysis, trying to say that they didn't get enough sleep. And they used the cell phone evidence to try to make a claim that they were distracted at the time of the accident. First, let's deal with the claims of distraction. Now, this expert was claiming that because an album cover was created for a song near the time of the accident, that it meant that the driver was on the phone selecting music with their thumb, right? In the application, clicking on something to select music, distracted. Now, in our testing and analysis, we were able to prove conclusively that actually what really occurred was that iHeartRadio switched the album cover automatically as it switched from one artist to another. So as it went from Justin Bieber to Rihanna, that this was simply an automated function of the application itself and required zero user interaction. So zero evidence of distraction or utilizing the phone at all during the time of the accident. With that argument no longer viable, they then proceeded to do a lifestyle analysis. Now, what we have here are driver's logs that you see on this screen. They took the information from this, they correlated it to the phone records, like you see here, where you have incoming and outgoing calls. So we have all that information too. They compiled this information together where you have the driver's logs versus the phone records to try to show when they're driving and when there's phone activity. Ultimately, all this information is leading to the following. So what we have here is the lifestyle analysis created by the opposing expert. And what we see, for example, on Sunday is that the largest gap of time that the driver would have to sleep was two hours and 23 minutes. And on that entire day, we have two hours and 23 minutes, an hour and 30 minutes, an hour and 16 minutes that they could have slept. Now, it is also sporadic to the rest of the times throughout that week with a not large enough gaps to get sufficient sleep. It does appear uh, this does look highly problematic. However, this expert made a significant error in their analysis. You see, they included incoming activity as activity that would require you to be awake, not just outgoing activity. Outgoing activity requires you to do something with the phone to send a message or to make a call and so forth. Incoming activity does not require you to do that. How many times have you gone to sleep and woken up the next morning with emergency text messages and emails and you got a voicemail and the rest? Uh, you weren't awake for that. You were asleep. So if you remove out the incoming activity, this driver had a normal sleeping schedule and there was no evidence of uh, a lack of sleep on the part of this driver. I know that computer forensics has been around for a while and that a tremendous amount of data can be recovered from them, including deleted data. But when it comes to cell phones as evidence, how are they different from computers? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It's easy to think about cell phones as being little computers we carry around in our pockets, but computers and cell phones are quite different in many ways. In computer forensics, being the oldest discipline within digital forensics, we can force those devices in most instances to give all of their data up. We can also collect the evidence in such a way where the device is powered off by removing the hard drive and creating what's called a forensic image as a process of a forensic acquisition. Uh, with a cell phone, that is different too. Uh, we have to collect the data in a different way called an extraction, uh, which we'll cover later. Uh, but there's also just the simple fact that there are many phones that come out every year. Uh, there's many operating system upgrades and security patches that change uh, the artifacts on that phone and the way we have to go about getting the data. And it's a constant flux between these new devices coming out and then the cell phone forensic tool manufacturers and experts uh, figuring out how to get the data off of those devices.